you know, I feel like part of my job, Taylor, is to help people be comfortable in discomfort. So the discomfort is all those unpleasant things that we can talk about in terms of bias or environmental degradation. The comfort part comes in saying, you know what, but there's beauty out there that we, that there's beauty enough for us to revel in and recognize. That, that is the job. And I try to do it by upholding the sanctity of science while at the same time turning over tables in the temple. Welcome to The Possibilists. The Possibilists is a podcast collaboration between the Smithsonian Earth Optimism and Pelicanus. The Smithsonian Conservation Commons Earth Optimism Initiative is changing the conservation narrative from one that focuses on problems and perils to highlighting impactful solutions. By celebrating what's working in conservation, they seek to inspire action and move global community from a sense of loss to one of hope and finding solutions to save our planet. Pelicanus is a conservation-based collective in continuous wonder of the healing and encouragement that is possible on this planet and the people making it happen. We are committed to telling these stories and demonstrating optimism through science. Now in this partnership, we spotlight conservationists working with a possibilistic attitude for solution-based efforts to tackle the world's critical environmental struggles. We're attempting to reframe the narrative around conservation to show that conservation successes are possible through changes in attitude and implementation of intentional change. In this episode of The Possibilist, we talked to Dr. J. Drew Lanham, a professor of wildlife ecology at Clemson University, where his research focuses on songbird ecology as well as the African-American role in natural resources conservation. Dr. Lanham is also an author and award-nominated poet of The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, as well as his collection of poems, Sparrow Envy, both of which were published in 2016. Please enjoy this amazing conversation we have with Dr. Lanham. All right, well, Dr. Drew Lana, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're so excited to have you. We uh, big fan of your work, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for for joining us. It's great to be here, Austin Taylor. Um, be here, be there, wherever we are in between the two, right? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm admiring your your it looks like almost like a hunting lodge in the back. That's so cool looking. <laughs> I love the art and and the plants on the ceiling, and yeah, so cool. Yeah, this is um, this place I called the thicket. So it was, um, you know, it's it, well, quintessentially me, it was a storage house that I converted to what was supposed to be a writing shack. I mean, it from the inside, it gives the appearance of being out isolated somewhere, but it's very Thoreauvian. And then I can skate inside to, you know, modern convenience in relatively short order. But um, yeah, so thank you. It, it's um, it's a it's become a comfort zone. It is the Zoom room, um, <laughs> you know, and the think, you know, sort of a, like a, you know, those remember those little goldfish bowls you used to get at the fair, and you'd see the goldfish, one lone goldfish gulping. You could flip like a quarter, and you could win a goldfish or a nickel or whatever back in the day. I'm probably giving my age away here. Um, but yeah, so instead of like a big sea tank, this is like a little tiny goldfish bowl that I exist in. So I try not to gulp too much for air here, though. So before we kind of get into the questions, do you mind kind of just introducing yourself and, you know, let everyone know where you work and what, what kind of research you do? Sure. My name is Jay Drew Lanham, and I am a professor of wildlife um, ecology at Clemson University. Um, specifically, um, I call myself a cultural and conservation ornithologist. So I'm a, I'm a bird brain, but um, I, I go at birds from sort of the traditional conservation standpoint and trying to understand impacts to habitat and, um, and, and the like threats um, from all sorts of different directions, but then trying to look at all of those through the prism of of culture um for me primarily um race um as a as a southern black uh person trying to understand for example interactions between landscapes um that 
were occupied first by indigenous peoples, but then obviously changed by enslaved peoples. Um, but now that our conservation land, so trying to bring those kinds of things into focus so that we broaden the conservation conversation in a way that's not just including the same sort of, quite frankly, privileged crowd that's been focused really closely on birds and has done some good in that, but um, has largely ignored um, the history of the landscape um, beyond the ecology, which has led to sort of whitewashing really a lot of um, the important factors out. So I do that kind of, I do that kind of work. Um, love wildness um, in all its permutations, but think a lot about how we define it and maybe how we need to redefine it um, to, to, to again, br to, to bring some depth to the, con the, the conversation of expanse. Because really, when we talk about wildness, it's all about the expansive nature of untouched and untrammeled, which is a myth. Um, but then to begin to understand the depth of those, those kinds of conversations. So that's, that's kind of the work that I do. So um, I, bring, I try to bring things back through the prism of culture, ultimately to conserve and make things better, um, not just for birds, but for all of what I call lesser beasts, <laughs> um, including humans, because, you know, birds rock. And I, I do appreciate you uh, saying conservation conversations, because that's actually one of the, the names of one of our, uh, our series, <laughs> just to, you know, it's a little bit of a tongue twister, but, it, you know, it's basically what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, for a long time, um, what I've I've been trying to do is expand the science. And I mean, I work at a land grant and, um, and, and the land grant mission at its heart is supposed to be about expanding the science beyond the walls of the ivory tower to the public so that the public benefits from what all this thinking and cogitating that we do, all the research, um, all the teaching that that gets out. And, and so I began to recognize when I was teaching undergrad, undergraduate students in conservation biology years ago, you know, you're standing in front of a auditorium of 60 or 80 or 100 students and day after day you're going in and, um, and you're, you're droning on and on about extinction and fragmentation and climate change and, um, and all the other and not much good. And, um, and if you, you look closely, um, you'll, you'll see sort of some looks of despair um, and, and some searching that students are doing sort of up here because they're trying to figure out what exactly in the hell did I get myself into because everything seems to be going to hell in a handbasket. Um, and nobody's telling me how to, you know, how I work, what the real world solutions might be, you know, so what's possible. Um, so really for me, there was this moment um, when one of my early grad students met me in the hall and, um, and I, I can't remember the year as much as I can remember the browser. It was Netscape 2.0. And um, he, he said, they found it, they found it. I'm like, they found what? I had just come out of one class and was headed to the con bio class. And he said, um, he said, they found ivory bills. And I remember going in and waiting for um, the page to upload because it was Netscape 2.0 and, you know, like, and I printed off um, the story and I read it to my students. And in the middle of reading that story to my students about the rediscovery of the Ivory Bill Woodpecker in Arkansas, um, I mean, I got really emotional. Um, and, and it was the moment for me of, of hope, you know, so sort of living Emily Dickinson's poem, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, Perches in the Soul. Um, at least at that point, you know, when we thought we had it, hope was a thing with feathers that hitched up the big trees bowl 
And, and so that was the moment that I saw um, differences in faces, that I saw um, smiles, that I saw people's shoulders lift. Um, and part of that was that the students, Austin and Taylor, were they saw me, I think, become emotional. I wasn't just the scientist and the lecturer up there, blah, 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 you know, um, test next Tuesday. Um, I wanted them to know that it meant something to me and that it should mean something to them. Um, and so it was a moment, at least I think, I would call it at least a moment of inspiration from a bird, but then a moment of empathy between the students um, and me. So that, that was life-changing for me. And so that's sort of the path that I've been on since then of, um, of sort of taking the science. And, you know, ironically enough, we just got news, what, a few weeks back, month or so, a couple of months back of the official re-extinction of ivory build and a lot of other um, birds. But, you know, I still have facsimiles of ivory bills around. They're still in my office. Um, not because um, that Sasquatch necessarily exists, um, but even if there is a sliver of a chance outside of what we prescribed, you know, if that's a possibility, then I'm holding on to that. And because um, I think even the smallest sliver of possibility of some corner having been unseen, um, unsearched, that maybe there's something there that we couldn't see. So there's, um, there's that part of me in anything that I do that I think some people, um, maybe they discount it as, as being as not being scientific. Um, but I, I like to say that it's, you know, for me, wonder is the gap between resting the gaps between what we know and what we don't know. And, um, and so while those birds are on an extinct list, um, scientifically, they're on a wonder list um, for me. So I sort of put them and um, and Backman's warbler, well, I call them swamp cane warblers and Eskimo curlews and um, heath hens and great auks and, and all those things. I put them on a wonder list because I wonder, you know, what the world would be like with those things, with Carolina parakeets and um, passenger pigeons. What would the world be like with those things? Um, and, and that helps me think about some larger context. So when I walk into a classroom, I'm not just sending people into states of mourning and despair, but helping them see what the work ahead might be and whether they want to do it, you know? Yeah, I, I think we're on the same path, you know, I, that we, we struggle with the idea of, you know, like you said, kind of being I, idealistic and non-scientific because as you kind of mentioned, a lot of the uh, evidence is pointing, pointing downward for a lot of these things. And so we're trying to highlight the good things happening to kind of inspire people to say, hey, it's not all gone. It's not all lost. If we kind of rally up, we can, we can reverse some of these trends. And, you know, I think we're on the, we're on the same, uh, we're on the same path. It's, it could be difficult, you know, and, you know, sometimes these weekly, you know, biweekly stories that we put out, uh, they really, they really help us <laughs> remind huh. ourselves that, Hey, we, we can get stuck in the, the mud too. Yeah. You know, um, it, it is, I, I, I call it a, um, a, I wrote an essay on Carolina parakeets and I think I called it a worry hole. And, and if you're in conservation, you're going to, you know, you dig plenty of those and, you know, we get mired in the mud, but we also, you know, it's a business of digging in sandy pits. And so you, you think you've dug out and then the sand tumbles back in on you. But ultimately, um, you know, to be able to be in a business 
where, um, you know, you don't discount sunrises or sunsets, um, you, where you get to see things that most people don't get to see and you still realize that there's beauty out there. Um, and, and again, that beauty once again is, is opens up all sorts of possibilities in heart and mind. So for me, um, again, to, to have students, for example, in, a, in an ornithology class, to not just teach them field marks, but to have them feel those marks um, so that gestalt becomes not just a concept, but practice. Um, and, and, and in that way, again, to begin to break down the barriers between human and non-human, which uh, again, I, I think in the, you know, in the best tradition of, of, of what we've done um, to sort of blur the lines. And, and when you blur some of those lines, there's the opportunity, there's an opportunity for, for some empathy. So, you know, to be able to feel what's, I mean, we do it all the time for our, you know, our family members, our four-legged family members, our, you know, our, those, those animals that have us as companions, um, you know, we, we, and the science would tell us that, now, you know, there's something else going on there, you know, whether it's co-evolution of humans and, and, um, and, and canids and dogs or, or what we can never, ever know is going on in cat brain, right? Um, but, you know, you know, when, you know, that kitty crawls up in your lap um, during certain times, you know, it may be feeling something that you're feeling, or at least sensing something. So, um, you know, I like to take that beyond and when you go beyond companion animals, but then you cross sort of this, um, this semi-permeable membrane of wildness out there, whether it's in your backyard or the back 40 or, you know, um, the backside of the North Slope, you, you've got to feel like there's some relationship that you have personally. And if you can feel that, if you can feel that that personal relationship, there's the opportunity for you to conserve because you're feeling something, you're you're valuing it in a way that has that that imbues affection. And if that affection um, is true, then you're going to work to do better for that thing that you love. <laughs> it's a love mission, but. You know, they don't they don't publish much in JWM about love, um, at least last time I checked, even though, I, uh, you know, I know, you know, Taylor and um, and his colleagues, you know, are doing some of that work and, and even talking about awe and um, and 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 defining the dimensions of those sorts of things, which is is really critical work. But sometimes it's it's really interesting picking up a paper and and looking at what the dimensions people breaking down the dimensions of wonder and awe and what that means. Um, you know, I want I want us to think hard about what we're doing, but some but I do not want us to overthink feelings because you know because we can do that. I mean, I've done it right. Yeah, you know, we we just we just spoke to um, Dr. Judy Mann. She's out of uh, South Africa with the Sombra. It's called it's a marine biological research and institute. And a lot of their shift has gone from you know aquariums to you know they just still do a lot of really great you know ecological research, but they're bringing up this huge effort to get people who live relatively coastal that have no idea what's in the ocean. They have no idea what's literally in their backyard just because they're just like, uh, it's cold. I don't want to go there. And so they're bringing them to the aquarium. They're bringing them, uh, uh, you know, specimens or whatever, just to kind of like, she, she called it, I think, removing the, the blue blanket to like, it up. Mm. 
And it's the same idea. She's like, if you don't know it's there, like you can't love it. You can't protect it. And just, we want to, you know, share those stories of people you know, going through that wonder and, you know, learning to, to love areas that they may have never even been to before. It's sort of this whole idea to me, at least of, of making a big world smaller. And it's, you know, I'm always reminded when I go back to, to my home place in Edgefield to, you know, this farm, this family farm that was in the middle of um, a national forest and everything was huge. You know, um, some of the trees that I climbed as a kid that were absolutely, you know, they were scraping the, the clouds. Now, you know, it's sort of like, oh, <laughs> you know, um, that's what that was. But then when I allow myself um, the memory and, and to, to feel sort of, again, that sort of wonder as a kid, you know, I, I come back to this, this whole idea of this, um, of this place that I knew and, and why I fell in love with nature in, in the way that I did. And, uh, and so I don't, as I said, I try to stay too much out of my head because my head then begins to, you know, sort of try to dampen my heart. So yeah, that whole idea, I love that blue blanket. Um, you know, I think about, I, I mentioned white throated sparrows here and every time I hear a white throated sparrow sing in my head not only am i enjoying that beautifully plaintive song but i'm also wondering i can almost see the range of that bird on some field guide range map and i'm wondering oh where did where did my white-throated sparrows come from you know now the scientist in me you know wants to um you know wants to put up a mist net ban the birds and see if I'm getting returns, right? The writer and poet in me is sort of like, you know what? The song is enough to mark that bird as a possible, a possible return. And, you know, I don't know what those statistics look like, um, but the confidence limits are much, much, much wider than if I abandoned that, banded that bird. So in that sort of way, as much as I could know, and it would be cool to know if a bird with some band number or a color band combination was returning to my yard as, as mind bending as that would be, um, you know, there's a part of me again in that wonder gap that says, oh, that could be the same white throated sparrow that was in the yard last fall and winter. It could be, it might not be, but it could be. And I'm okay with could be. I'm okay with that possibility. And the wonder of that, that song sort of making my brain wonder again, oh, you know, um, I mean, this bird could have come from tree line, right? Um, somewhere up in the Yukon maybe. Or um, it, it, it could have come from a, a closer population. But regardless, it makes me begin to take the world and make it smaller in a way. Um, and a bird does that. And so I think if we, if we can make the world smaller so that things are more tangible, you know, because if you tell somebody, oh, you know, if you say, well, climate change is about polar bears not having haulouts and they're never going to see a polar bear, or maybe they think that polar bears live with penguins, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and they can't understand, you know, North Pole from South Pole or maybe don't care. If I can take the concept of bad air days and I can say, you know what? You know, you watch the news today and they said, you know, if you live in New Orleans, don't go outside today. It's not safe because the air's bad. Um, and, and then begin to help people understand that maybe that same bad air, that bad hot air that you can't breathe is the same bad, hot, 
climate ultimately, warming climate, that's maybe creating issues for polar bears or pikas or whatever else, then I've made the wor world smaller. Now, I, you know, I haven't done, I haven't done a meta analysis, Austin. Um, I don't have any p values. I don't have any coefficients of determination. Uh, well, I do, but I'm not sure they would pass muster, <laughs> you know, outside of a literary journal. So, uh, I'd I'd love to get more into the uh, I don't know that the world you find yourself in, in between like the hardcore you know ecologist and you know writer and. Uh, cultural thinker, I guess, for lack of a better term. But I think a great way to do that would be let Taylor get into his questions and his ideas. And I think we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. I love so much of what you're saying, you know, in, in your writings and in a lot of your talks, you have so many quotable quotes here. Um, and as you're just explaining all that, I, I'm thinking of one that I, that, that has always caught me. It's between our head and our heart chakra is our voice. Um, and I've heard you say that a couple of times and I really appreciate that because it's, it's that connection of the two, um, you know, the, the science and the poet inside of you. And I've been in this wonderfully privileged, beautiful position to witness this rise of an eco celebrity a little bit. Um, <laughs> because I, I met you in autumn 2016, which is when your autobiography, uh, was published the home place memoirs of a colored man's love affair with nature and you've had so just from the outside looking in uh you know reading your book get, getting to take your classes and, and getting to know you i know drew lanham i know drew lanham through his autobiography i know drew lanham through uh, as a professor i know drew lanham as the person who was my teacher and my guide um I also know Drew Lanham as the one, as the man who wrote the nine rules for the black bird watcher, which is, is a statement is, is, is putting yourself out there. Um, so do you mind talking to us a little bit about who Drew Lanham is through his career? Some of the work that you did before this rise of your celebrity and then how this experience of, getting to be more well-known as a, as a writer um, in so many different circles. Well, thank you. Thanks, Taylor. Um, I'm black blushing right now, but I, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I think ultimately, you know, when I started off and I mentioned Netscape 2.0, um, I can remember those early years of, you know, struggling with, with, with publishing, right. You know, this whole publish and perish publisher perish paradigm. And, you know, as you start going along and I'm publishing papers on, you know, bird habitat relationships, impacts of forest disturbance and natural disturbances on birds. Um, a good many papers on herpetofauna and, and forested ecosystems and how they were being impacted by, you know, creation of road ruts or, um, or papers, a couple of papers on butterflies and power line rights of way and bat papers. And the students were doing most of this work, the graduate students who um, were wonderfully dedicated to the work. And I sort of got to latch on to so much of what they were doing. Um, but again, one of the things that I always wanted the students to be able to do at the end of the day was as they became experts, whether through a master's degree or a doctorate, was at the end of the day, you know, you'd have that question of so what? And, um, and that can't be a shrug. That can't be a, you know, well, then you maybe you've just wasted your time here. Because, I mean, yeah, it's important you've advanced this data set large and if we and I think it's for me it's important to look at everything as sort of this huge um, set of metadata and, uh, and and if we we think about all of these related parts you know if we take Leopold's admonition to keep all the parts and intelligently tinker then we can't separate one study really from another and I, I've been 
literally involved in some of those forest service studies where they tried to do that from an ecosystems standpoint. And let me tell you, it wasn't pretty. The stats didn't like it. You know, none of the models liked it. But at the end, um, and one of the failures, I think, of the projects was they never really had anyone to come in and say, all right, let's sit in a circle <laughs> um, and, and, and think about what we did here. And what were some of the values of, of doing this, aside from these results that we really had to twist the arm of the statisticians to say that anything statistically significant came out of it? What came out of it from this sort of whole idea of how we are going to move forward? What did we learn? Um, and, and so that, again, is sort of a change point in my career. Um, to I remember this paper of um, a student, um, Dr. Brand Cromer, he teaches at Augusta University now. Um, Brand had done this amazing study um, down at Savannah River site. And what we were seeing was that the road ruts that were being created in timbering and creating these forest gaps that we were also studying for everything, birds, herpetofauna, small mammals, um, that that these road ruts were essentially creating these fishless refuges. And it's the only place that I'd ever been where you can stand, you know, 10, 12 feet from someone and the, and the frog chorus would be so loud that you could not hear them. And, and, and so, but here, here were communities of herpetofauna um, that were benefiting from this forest disturbance. Well, that at the time, I mean, that wasn't the thing to say, right? And I remember us getting back the reviews on that paper and um, from, from ComBio, as a matter of fact. And, and this was back in the day, you were still getting, you know, a big manila envelope. And um, you could kind of tell what was going on based upon how heavy the envelope was. And, um, and, and this felt like a good one. And I remember um, Brand opening it and bringing it to me. And on the last page, it talked about the value of the work, but that they felt like it wasn't the proper message for conservation biology, right? And so I was like, so why? Because it's, you know, it was relating. No, it wasn't just saying go in and, you know, massacre the forest. But what it was saying was, you know, we need to think about what we do and how we do it in these larger lessons. So that was a lesson to me that even among the scientists, the science doesn't always win. Um, and, and so that jaded me a little bit. And um, I, I began to not only think about how we communicate with outsiders, so to speak, but how we communicate among ourselves. And, and what kind of community are we really? And, and, and not just what are we thinking, but what are we think, how are we thinking about what we think? You know, are we taking into account who people are are we taking into account when we send students out into the field um, that they may have fears um, or that there may be things going on out there that keep them from being the best that they can be so you know that's sort of a you know really a maybe the first two-thirds of my career I don't know whether I'm in the you know I'd like to think that I'm still ascending in some ways as a scientist, but the, you know, the, the break point again was one of, you know, I read Janice Ray's Ecology of a Cracker Childhood. Um, I've always had my students read a Sand County Almanac in Silent Spring. Um, they were reading E.O. Wilson. Um, but, you know, I was also listening to Marvin Gaye's The Ecology, right? And I'm like, wait a minute. The, you know, Brother Marvin wrote, you know, performed this song back in 70, um, 71. And back then it was, you know, only three decades. Now it's 50 years and it's still as relevant as it ever was. So I'm like, well, why hasn't that changed? 
why are we able to listen to that song? Yeah, we can bop our heads to the beat, but then listen to those lyrics and it's still mercy, mercy me. You know, we, we, we haven't come out of some place past recognition to reconcile so that then there's some reparation on the other side of that. So recognition is that first step. And, and science works to recognize science doesn't necessarily a lot of the science that we do um, in the past hasn't necessarily been interested in reconciling, not in conservation science. So um, not beyond sort of certain to me. Not tired paradigms, but easy ones to think about. So to think about you know, sort of the bell jar and just lock it down and call it wilderness and we'll be done with it. Um, but to think about truly what that interaction might be, that those, that roadside rut, as ugly it is on the side of the road, that if you put a barrier up so vehicles don't continue to go through it, you'll get a ton of wood frogs in there. And, and that's, that's a refuge. There are no fish there, there are no predators. And there's a way sometimes for us to make lemonade out of the lemons. Uh, you know, um, so that, that's been part of the evolution, not, not, not recognizing the bad, but, but trying at times to, you know, keep the teeter totter going. Cause I don't think it's any sort of, I, I don't want to call it, you know, a dynamic equilibrium, but let's, let's, let's really think about, you know, sort of this constant um, up and down, which is what it is. Um, we don't want to bottom out, right? Um, but we want to we want to understand how maybe to to not make the oscillation so dramatic. Um, we know there are going to be changes, but I, you know, I I, I want to invest in. Yeah, I want to invest in possibilities, but I also want to, you know, there are possibilities and there are probabilities, you know, and the probabilities are what statisticians deal in. The possibilities are what poets um, proffer. So um, to the to the point that we can think about conservation as being sort of the business of, of possibility, that's that's sort of where I've come to in my career and the work that I do. So yeah, still picking up the paper from the journal, trying to understand what they did, how they did it, what they found, how that connects to other research or to some conservation issue, but then also reading between the lines. There is so much that, you know, we've all been out there in the field and done the research and we all know the sausage grinder that is publication. And the blood, the sweat, and the tears don't come through in that. You know, that's why it's so important, Taylor. I, you know, I've seen one of the one of the biggest evolutions, and I, I want to do this study somehow. Maybe one of you guys can help me or help me find someone. I want to look at the evolution of thesis and dissertation acknowledgments. Um, because people are much more emotive now in their acknowledgments and what they will say and that they will feel in ways and acknowledgments that 20 years ago they never would that they would dare to say um that they loved someone or that there would be some lyric lyrical verse somewhere in it or something like that i mean hell I, you know, I want to start seeing epigraphs on dissertation chapters is what I want to see. But but at the end of the day, that all this work that you've done to become an expert has meant something to you and that you feel something. So, you know, you mentioned, the, you know, the voice being between head and heart, you know, that tradition. I mean, that's a long tradition, but, I, you know, I just. I just wrote this letter. I called it a letter to Hank, but it's a letter to Henry David Thoreau. Um, and part of part of our failure as conservation environmentalists, nature nurturers, let's call us that, 
part of our failure is that we don't use this enough. You know, this, we get into it, most of us, because we feel it here and we have questions here. But then ultimately, you know, if we don't talk about it, it just sort of bounces back and forth between these echo chambers. And, and the thing that Thoreau did that was so beautiful, I believe as, as Walden was being published, um, you know, maybe printed, I can't remember, uh, Thoreau wasn't talking about Walden. Thoreau was talking about the Fugitive Slave Act. <laughs> he, was, he was incensed. Um, and so here he was blending culture and conservation in a way. And, and so many people don't know that you, when you say civil disobedience, they're like, who, what, who wrote that? <laughs> You're like this dude over here, um, who everybody wants to criticize as staying around the corner from his, you know, his parents' house. But you know what? Um, dude was living, Thoreau was living in a way that advance not just how we think about nature and sort of self in that kind of transcendentalist um you know way but that he was helping people find liberty humanity and one didn't get in the way of the other and so you know when i look at that when i read civil disobedience when I understand who, and not that Thoreau was perfect, I'm not saying that, um, but to understand that he was willing to stand up in front of people and speak to let this come through in between head and heart and to speak as forcefully for humanity as he did for nature, that's, that's heroic to me. You know, um, and, and so that's a tradition that I don't think, in some ways, it's, it's sort of been, people have seen it as, well, that's the soft side of, I mean, it's not even science, even though Thoreau is a wonderful naturalist. Um, so much of that social side uh, that, that, that humanist was, was sort of, has been washed out of who Thoreau was. So. You know, anytime I'm teaching a class now and we're talking about, you know, and you always get the eye roll when you say, when you even mention Henry David Thoreau, because students are like, oh, God, I got to I got to read that again. I got to get through that. And then you say, no, I want you to read this. Or you redact Thoreau's name, you know, and you say, read this. What do you think about it? And, you know, and they get through it. They're like, who is this? He was pissed off. And well, that's the row, you know, that dude y'all discounted because you said he spent too much time talking about that pond um, and that he wasn't real anyway, because he wasn't out in the wilderness, blah, blah, blah. It, it, so how real, how real are we, you know? So, um, you know, as a white egret symbolizes conservation for some, you know, do black lives matter? So you, you got to have some sort of idea of, to me, uh, for me, career-wise, Taylor, to make, again, make the world smaller so that we can touch one another, so that we can touch wildness. Because um, I think as far away as wildness has to be, that ultimately it has to be tangible in some way, um, that you got to reach out you know, with some heartstring or, you know, imaginary string to, to, to rope it and to feel like, yeah, okay. You know? Um, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm sort of all over the place. I know, but, uh, that's, that's sort of the, sort of the evolution so far. So you have this wonderful ability to make what, would be to other people all over the place come together with a through line. And uh, it, it's, it's special because, you know, as somebody who has uh, been in several of your classes and has walked into Marvin Gaye playing 
I'm going, <laughs> oh, sh- all right. <laughs> you know, I can say that, you know, because and, and bringing up Thoreau and, and him being pissed, Austin and I come from, you know, a background of growing up listening to Rage Against the Machine and Tupac and, you know, Most Deaf or Yassine Bey and, and so many others. And they're, they're all saying the same, having this similar message. And it's all about being pissed off um, about a lot of things and how they're all interrelated. So I guess that's a good way to like kind of maybe transition into some of the stuff that you're doing now um, and some of your work. Um, I know you're working on, well, I mean, just a last year, was it the, the article that you wrote on uh, for Audubon? What do we do about John James Audubon? It was a powerful piece. Um, you redid the, the nine rules for the black bird watcher. Um, I know you're working on witness trees. Um, I know you're working on some other things. And when I think about your work, because you've helped me with my work as seeing conservation as an extension of social justice. And when I think through your work, I think of Chico Mendez's uh, quote, where he says, you know, environmentalism without class struggle is just gardening. Mm. And whether it's class struggle or race struggle or whatever, you know, it's that social justice struggle. Um, It's just gardening otherwise. It's just we're planting plants and we're just, you know, looking at the pretty plants and going forward. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's something special about conservation. There's something special about this this idea of bringing culture and nature together. And just would love to hear your thoughts on how this is all intertwined within your current work right now. Yeah, man. I, you know, Taylor, that was one of the things that first I remember, you know, back when we met and I understood from, you know, sort of your playlist, right? You know, that I was dealing with a different cat um, in, a, in, a, in a great way. So, I, you know, the current work really to, um, I mean, almost all of it is in first person because that's the data I mind best. Uh, but ultimately to be able to take first person, hopefully, and have it become multiple people so that people say, oh, you know, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that, that John James Audubon was an enslaver or a phrenologist and was digging into, you know, burial mounds and into indigenous graves. I didn't know he was that person. Or to have other people um, you know, those, those people who would say, oh, now, you know, I'm going to think about him differently. I'm going to think about that work differently. But by the same token, you know, you get the letters for people who say, oh, what does it matter? Have you seen that? Have you, have you seen, you know, the red tailed hawk print? Um, that's beautiful. Yeah. He wasn't perfect, but, and I'm like, okay, so that's that's not just illumination for the reader but it's for me it's an illumination to understand how far we have to go so you know that work to bridge um history and science and culture which to me are inextricably linked or you don't have to dig very far to understand just sort of the roots of um of bias in science um to to dictate to um, people why they have the right or some divine decree to subjugate others, you know, that's manifest destiny, right? So to, to, to bring those together so that people at least pause at the page turn and are like, huh, hmm, okay. Um, and that maybe they see a little more than the colors on the page that they began to read between the lines. And if you're reading between the lines, um, there's, there's something different going on. So, you know, part of what we've fallen into, I think, as, a, um, as nature nurturers and, and in the work that we do is that we've relied solely on what's written and not been able to read between the lines. And so, you know, we read the lines that say that there's unpotable water in Flint. And we read that. But we don't read between the lines that tell us where the potable water is and and why it's there, but not there. 
And then all you got to do, though, because that data is there, all you got to do is read. I mean, well, people in Ann Arbor got plenty of water to drink that's clean, that's fresh. People in Flint don't. So what's, what are the differences, right, between those communities? What are the differences? And then you begin to, to dig. And that's an environmental thing. That's, I mean, you know, I can certainly link that to birds, but in, as environmentalists, especially as conservationists, you know, and if we've sort of tasked ourselves with dealing with nature outside of human context, which is, you know, which is felonious. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's felonious. <laughs> um, and it's, it's fallacy. I mean, because what we set ourselves up to do is separate. And we set ourselves up to separate from nature and when we set ourselves up to separate, we set ourselves up to subjugate. And if that is the case, then, you know, you're on this dangerous trail of saying, you know what? Um, not only is, <laughs> and this, I'm going to get, this is, this is the eco heretic in me, maybe. Not only are we saying America is only good for American plants and animals, but it's only good for the people that we call Americans from some standpoint. So, you know, those are, are discussions and questions that we need to be investigating, that we need to be sitting down and we need to have. And they all touch on civil rights and social justice, um, but we gotta wrap our heads around this idea, of same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. This is a mantra I'm constantly repeating to myself because that helps me understand my connection to that person that I never met or that I won't ever meet or the people that came before me or my ancestors that didn't have the choice to work the soil. Um, and so, you know, these finite resources that we deal with um, at, on this earth, you know, we're sharing them not just over space, but through time, not just in this time, but through time, whatever you want to call this Anthropocene, I call it the Identocene, because I, I, I think it's, you know, we're, we're in this place where we're trying to figure out who the hell we are, not just culturally as a country, um, but each of us sort of on a daily basis, you know, you, you think about going in and saying, well, what am I today? You know, how do I feel today? And, um, you know, sometimes I think who we are is as fluid as fish. And, 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 and in that fluidity, you know, there's this new way that we've got to think about any of this. Because the easy tack has been to say, okay, you hear, you hear, you hear, you do that, you do that, you do that, and we'll all be fine. And that's not the case, right? And many cultures have known that. You and I have talked about this. You know, Taylor, you've schooled me on so much. I mean, you know, this, this whole idea of identity in so many ways being fluid that so many people in Western society are, are, are struggling with, you know, there are large portions of the world that haven't struggled with those kinds of issues. So, you know, what we're struggling with now for example, is it wild or isn't it wild? You know, does it belong here or, 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 or does it belong here? Um, why is it here? You know, I, I always go back to the case of the European starling. Uh, God, what a, what a brilliantly beautiful bird that didn't ask to be here, but was brought here for human design, for hubris. Um, but you can go out on Fifth Avenue and shoot one and nobody would say anything. So, you know, but there are people who've said that about human beings. So I can take a starling and I can see a human life in starling life and I can see starling life in human life. And I think if we, the work for me then is to blur the lines. I'm not trying to make it clear how separate we are from any of this. I really want to, I want, I want perforated lines. I really don't, man, I talk, I think I talk and run on sentences. <laughs> um, uh, 
I love M dashes, semicolons. I love perforated punctuation. Um, you know, and, and so for us to get to a point of being better, we really have to think, yeah, there's this internalization of it all, but then that internalization ultimately has to explode into some sort of cosmic shards of light that touches every other thing. And that, and, and that can happen on a daily basis, you know, at some moment where you're like, ah, oh, you know, I, I get it. I don't know what I get, but I get it. It's there. And you got to be comfortable in that place, in that space. Um, and so, you know, I feel like part of my job, Taylor, is to help people be comfortable in discomfort. So the discomfort is all those unpleasant things that we can talk about in terms of bias or environmental degradation. The comfort part comes in saying, you know what, but there's beauty out there that we, that there's beauty enough for us to revel in and recognize, to recognize and revel in, in this thing, this beautiful, simple thing that we see that may be dirt cheap, that may be common, but it always amazes me how many people can just sort of let red birds, let a cardinal pass by and say, oh, it's just another cardinal. Really? I mean, it, it's, do you, do you see that? Do you, did you see that? Um, so that, that is the job, I think. And I try to do it by upholding the sanctity of science while at the same time turning over tables in the temple. You know, you need to, um, somebody needs to go in there from time to time and flip them and say, what the hell are y'all doing? Why are you in here, you know, um, counting your shekels when you could be out there helping people have clean water to drink? What, what are we doing? And um, so, you know, that's sort of the, the place you just, you know, you do what you can um, until you can't. It sounds very zen. It's it's almost like there's no analysis re uh, needed, no analysis necessary. It's just you do it because you're doing it. And you keep doing it because you keep doing it. And it's Gary Snyder's dirt work. You know, you go forward because you're there whether it be a cosmic inter interpretation or invocation, you're, you're, you're there right now and you're the one doing the work because you're the one doing the work. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Dirt work. I mean, yes, yeah, Snyder, I'm not gonna argue with that. Right. <laughs> um, I, you know, that, that's part of when I, when I said that, you know, I don't want thinking to get in the way of feelings. What I meant was, um, you know, if you go back to that point, uh, you know, and I talk about punctuation, I, 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 you know, the thing, the, one of the first things that ever made me pause, I like to say is the black commas that I saw swimming in a mud puddle and they were tadpoles and all of those little commas there, um, that just, I mean, and we've, you know, most of us have done that, been on our hands and knees, you know, just looking at them and wondering how they got there. And then, you know, you, you learn, um, you know, that's the opportunity to learn about sex and, and, and frogs do it, birds be it, do it, bees do it. But here are these tadpoles that, that connect you in some sort of way. And sometimes it's necessary, I think, in the heat of all the thinking that we do all the data that we can put in complex models, um, all of the publications that we can garner, that at some point in time that it was probably some comma, maybe it was tadpoles for some, may have been scarlet tanagers for others, um, that puts you in a place to pause. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> 
what is that? How did it get there? And then the scientist begins to take over because the next day you come and you look and maybe you count and you're like, oh, there are more or there are less. And if there are less, maybe then the conservation scientist begins to kick in. You're like, why are there less? What's going on here? And you start seeing that there hasn't been rain in like a couple of weeks and the pond starts drying up. And so lots of us did what? You know, you'd see by that time that some of these tadpoles were developing little legs and you're like, oh, OK. And you've read and you've done some research and you're like, these are going to become frogs. Maybe I can save a few if I take them in, I put them in my aquarium, I can watch them develop, but then I can let them go afterwards. And maybe you do. And then maybe the next year you notice that the puddle gets filled at the same time and that there are more commas there to make you pause or maybe it doesn't get filled. And then you begin to develop this data set and you're mining, but all the while there's the child inside you that's stopping you at the puddle. And I think that we overthink sometimes and we lose sight of what made us stop in the first place. And, and that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible with quotes. What did Rachel Carson say? Sometimes it's better to feel than to think. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but, I, you know, I, I look at Silent Spring and I read that. Um, and you understand that what Rachel Carson was going through in her life in so many ways and, and how people were coming at her. But that she heroically did what she did. She couldn't stop. Right. And whatever was here for Rachel, which was a lot, and whatever was here was a lot, ultimately came out of here. And um, and so the conversations that you guys are that you and Austin are generating, um, you know, it's a beautiful thing because, you know, it, it's an opportunity off of the page and between the lines for us to say what we think and feel and what's going on. And, uh, you know, again, that's the name of the greatest album of all times. What's going on? So I'm not going to argue. With, I'm not going to argue with any of it. You're talking about beauty. You're talking about beauty and how that can ground us in our work in conservation, bring us back to, you know, who we are as kids. And I'm thinking about this idea of beauty. And I think about your work and I think about how important your work is. And then I think about, you know, my my experience in the South. Well, one of the things that conservation has taught me as a human is that you can hold both the wonder and the reverence and the awe and the beauty on the one hand, and you can hold the hardship and the trauma and the depression and the sadness in the other. Dealing with an endangered species, uh, a catastrophic forest fire, any of these things, you hold them both at the same time. And I experienced that with my work in the South, you know, I'm thinking about the work on the forest, but I'm also thinking about, you know, Catherine Coleman Flowers work uh, down in um, Alabama, outside of Montgomery, you know, the working so hard on the folks there that have hookworm because there's untreated raw sewage going out into those communities. And then I think about your work and I think about you know, these witness trees ideas. And I think about all this and I'm wondering for you, is there a beauty in truth and reconciliation? Is there a beauty that comes through with justice? And, and is it the same kind of beauty? Is it the same kind of motivating energy even? And I'm just mm -hmm. curious your thoughts on that. Wow, great question. Taylor, you know, You've heard me talk, uh, you know, I said, I talked about, um, well, I think, you know, I'm not, I don't think I'm the first to say it. There, there, you have to have recognition first. You have to recognize um, and, and, and describe the situation and, and, and recognition, um, with recognition comes truth, right? And so uh, truth and, and the whole truth. And, and so that recognition is, is critical first. And there, it, there's some semblance of, um, you know, with, with that recognition, 
you know, it's sort of like the, the, the sun rising, that it, it can get warmer and that there's more light perhaps to come. But more light does not come until that sun breaks, um, you know, that, that, that horizon. So that recognition is first. Then, you know, that truth that you begin to get, which is a, 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 a kind of dawn breaking, which is beautiful. From then recognizing, you can begin to say, oh, you know, there are clouds or it's a clear sky or um, I'm going to be in a forest and, I, and, and or in a holler and the sun's not going to get to me until it reaches a certain point on the horizon. From recognition, you then become you, you can you can reconcile where you are. You can reconcile what the temperature is going to be like, whether it's going to be hot, whether you're going to need to move to shade, whether so recognition precedes reconciliation and reconciliation begins to help us understand how we can enjoy the beauty of the day or whether it's going to be oppressive in it. And if it's going to be oppressive, we know we got to move to shade. We know we have to have some sort of relief in that reconciliation, but there can still be beauty there. Right. And then you work if there's been damage to repair reparation. And, and, and that reparation, some people would say, well, there is where all the beauty comes in. Well, um, there, there can be a great deal of beauty at that apex, um, but we understand that, that, that you know, there's an orbit that's taking place, right? And that, that soon we're, we're gonna be in shadow and dark again. And that cycle has to come back around. So one of the things that, you know, when we think about beauty is to, is to try to understand um, sort of the, where we can find it, where we can grasp bits of it, because the entirety of it is, 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 is hard to hold. Um, it's hard to, to get a hold of. So, you know, if, if, if you've got to run to the perfect spot every time to see the sunrise, then you're missing the in-between. You're missing that, that light just breaking. Um, and so I think it's important wherever we are to try to find, and for some people in, situ in those situations, that's, that's all they get you from day to day or hour to hour is some recognition of something beautiful. You know, it may not be what you see, it may be what you hear that allows you to, you know, to rock to some beat that gets you from point A to point B. You know, um, it could be remember the smell of your grandmother's sweet potato pie, you know, and that makes you smile. You're like, oh, okay. You know, and that gets you from this minute to the next. But that beauty um, of justice and what justice is um, or what right is or you know, celebrating that, you know, yeah, there's a chance. It is possible, <laughs> we learn, it is possible for um, a jury that, that doesn't look like me to maybe do the right thing. And then in that moment, even though, now understand that even, no, Ahmed Arbery didn't get, he's dead. Um, you know, there, there, there is this sort of systemic justice that you hope catches fire. But in that moment, right, in that moment, I said, you know what? That is, that, that's hopeful. That's a possibility. That is something there that says, you know what? Um, these were people that did the right thing that delivered justice, um, that, that, that long arc that, you know, MLK talked about, that they shortened it. Not only did they shorten it, they straightened it out. And so in that instance, that's beauty, you know, and, and even as all around us, there are all these other injustices that are taking place and that will take place, if you don't allow yourself to see the, the sun 
crack the horizon and recognize that beauty. And if, and if, and if all you can wait for is for the full born glory of the sun, then you may be disappointed when the clouds come and it's muted. So again, there is this beauty that is in truth, that is in justice, um, that is in, in, that I think we have to grasp along the way because my, you know, as my grandmother used to say, you know, the world didn't give it, the world didn't take it away. So in those instances where you can grab the joy, where, you know, you can hear a white throated sparrow song or, you know, you take a moment, you don't recognize it at first, but then you're like, wait a minute, that bird that's flying like that, what is that? And you're like, in a minute, you're like, oh, it's a pigeon. But then you're like, that's a pigeon. Wow. <laughs> you know, and look how, look how strong of a flyer it is. That flock of birds that you see out there that are dancing across the sky in arabesque and um and you're like oh my god this just i don't believe it your jaws dropped and there you are in awe and wonder and you get closer and they're starlings right do you, does that discount the beauty hopefully not for some it does but uh, you know, I say that I use that example to say that, you know, that's a matter of perspective. And so, you know, as we zoom in and out on things on justice, on truth and, and those things, we have to understand um, that, yeah, different people are going to see beauty at different perspectives with their glasses zoomed in or zoomed out. But I think ultimately for us all to see it, from the widest, best perspective, we got to take our binoculars down and see everything around us. And, and, and then, you know, you see in the periphery or straight ahead, things that are beautiful or not so pretty, but you realize it's all the same part of the same picture. It's all part of the same scape. And, and then you can begin to say, okay, so how do I make things better? You know, I realize everything's not going to be perfect, um, but how can I make things better in the periphery? How do I make things better that are straight ahead of me that I've been ignoring, that I've been stepping over, running through, looking past? How do I make all that better? And, you know, I just go back to that whole thing. If you can see a bit of beauty in something, then um, there's the possibility of seeing more of it in the next thing and or next person so that's a hard exercise you know that's a that's a hard exercise um but quite honestly these days um is somebody speaking a kind word who you do not know and you have no idea what their affiliation is what their religion is who they voted none of that that but they maybe they spoke a kind word to you that's beautiful that's beautiful. And, you know, that recognition maybe is a little more obvious to me after, you know, we've spent all this time underground, you know, in these, in these bunkers of, of home and in quarantine, that's, you know, that's the, the comma in the puddle to slow you down. So, you know, most of us aren't taking pictures of mud puddles. But when you understand what they do for us, sort of in that way of having us slow down for it, um, perspective changes, perspective changes. So, yeah, I, I think it's I think that's a critical thing. And I, you know, I'll say this. I think Americans especially, I think we're, you know, we're dour. It seems like you know, on our way to, to talk about how bad everything is and, and, and yeah, shit is, can get bad. It can be, yeah, it's out there, but on the, you know, on the, on the way you're stomping on stuff you could pause for, for just a second that might give you energy to speak louder at the protest. That's been important for me 
you know, to recognize the beauty in the backyard or to not overlook, you know, the ninth cardinal because I've seen eight. Um, that every red bird ain't the same. That there are these gradation, these hues, you know, there's a difference between vermilion and scarlet and rouge. And, and that's out there if you're willing to look. So there's, there's justice in that, recognizing difference. There's beauty in, in recognizing difference. And, and there's some reconciliation and reparation in respecting it. And I think so much of that can be, you know, what we do in nature and to nature that we can come out of the other side of it with our binoculars down and say, OK, yeah, I, I, this all this was out there. I just didn't see it. I just was focused in too tight, you know, and we can see a broader field of view that way. So. Um, Taylor, I go back and forth, like I tell people, I go from Zen to atheist every day and back again. Um, atheist is in back again, but then, you know, it has to seeing beauty sometimes happens best with your eyes closed and, and to feel something, to hear it, to smell it. Um, you know, it's like any sensory deprivation others heighten. So, you know, play that game. And find if you try to find something in a day that stops you for just a minute, something somebody says, um, some smell, uh, something you see, then you've given yourself a bit of justice. You know, you remind me of William Blake. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. You know, and when you're looking at a pigeon and finding wonder in the pigeon, you go, oh, man, I've seen a million pigeons, but I get to see this pigeon right now. You know, that's a, a fractal experience of Satori right there. You know, it's the it's enlightenment and recognizing that enlightenment isn't a goal. It's an experience that we're all having that we can wake up to. And uh, an experience of justice, an experience of of Ahmud Arbery and Brianna Taylor and Captain Coleman Flowers' experience, and and the pigeon and the blackbird and the and and just keep going. They're all infinite expressions of that of that beauty. Amen. I, yeah, that 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 those fractals. Um those shards of light, you know, that are just reaching us from stars that don't exist anymore, at least in our perceptions, uh, you know, that, that to me is sort of a, it, you know, that's part of the letting go of the roller coaster and putting your hands up and enjoying the ride. Cause you know, we're only figments of our own imaginations anyway. So I'm, I'm trying to, in some way, while we're here, you know, meeting you, now meeting Austin and understanding the mission that y'all are on, you know, it feels, um, you know, it feels like you can walk, you know, sort of arm in arm. And if you imagine people walking across that Edmund Pettus Bridge, right? Um, into the face, knowing face of danger um, and what lies ahead, but knowing that this is the way ahead. You know, there's beauty in that. Um, and even in that brutality, there, there, was a, there was a momentary beauty that you said, oh, okay, this is how it's got to be. And this is how we go forward in some different way. So figuratively, literally, however, we got to join arms to do this thing. You know, I hope I'm about that. That's what I want to be about anyway. Dr. Lanham, thank you again so much. That was a beautiful conversation. Um, if you don't mind, can you share where uh, our, our listeners, viewers can, you know, consume more of your work, find you on Instagram or whatever, you know, where, where can people find you? 
Wow. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm on the old person, social media, Facebook, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm there is J drew Lanham on Instagram is, uh, at wild and in color Twitter, um, at, at wild and in color. And then, um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly present on, uh, the Google. So I'm, I'm not too hard to find out there. Um, my poetry is out there, but I've just, I wanted to thank you, Austin and Taylor for really giving me the platform, giving me the, um, the time to, to speak to these issues of the heart. So thank you. And please um, keep doing the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you again to Dr. Lanham. Please go and find his books. They are truly amazing. And he is a true voice of conservation in our time. Host and producer for this episode are Austin and Taylor Parker. Producers are Kat Coots and Andrea Santi. Music was provided by a Picture Book Studios. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. And thanks again. We'll talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.